right, so we'll start our <clears throat> study of the book of Daniel. Let's look at our title pages, uh, or title page. The, Daniel. Daniel means God is my judge. It is 14 chapters long, much shorter than the other ones that we saw. Notice they were all 40s and 50s. This is 14 chapters long. Now, the author is Daniel the prophet. He is one of the major prophets in the Christian Bible. I have him listed on your charts as one of our major prophets. However, in the Ketuvim, or the writings of the Hebrew Bible, he is not a major prophet. And the reason that I bring that up for you is because when we start our minor prophet next week, it's also 14 chapters long mm -hmm. when we start with Joel. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, or Hosea, sorry. It's 14 chapters long. And so, remember, the major prophets are major prophets because their texts are lengthier. Well, Daniel's text is 14, and one of the minors is 14. That's a little bit confusing for us. But the Hebrew Bible doesn't have him listed as a major prophet. They have him in the writings. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps that's part of it. Uh, it was written around 530 to 535 B.C., <clears throat> but it describes the time frame of 605 to 586. So the book is written at the tail end of his life, but it's describing all that's occurred since that first deportation occurs out of Jerusalem. He's the first to go. It starts right there. So his <clears throat> ministry is his entire lifetime. It's approximately 80 years or so that he is in ministry. Right. Let's look at who was Daniel. Well, Daniel was a Jewish boy who was born in the lineage of the royal family of King David. As Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, begins to take territory, we see that he begins by taking young, good-looking, intelligent members of the lineage of kings. Why would he do that? <clears throat> because if you take these important people with you first, the uh, royal line is less likely to come against you in any military action if you've got their captives. Mm -hmm. If you've got their people and you, they know that if they come against you, you're gonna kill their sons, grandsons, whatever, they're less likely to come against you. So it was a very common thing to do, is go in and take the ones that you think would be the most um, important to you and keep those captive, and then, and then perhaps you are less likely to be attacked. So those are the ones that he takes. <clears throat> In 605, he takes the first captive, of which Daniel and many of his friends and relatives were part of. This elite group of young Jewish royals would be taken as insurance. We are told specifically of four boys, likely somewhere around 12 to 14 years old. Their names were Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and Daniel. Now later they're going to be given Babylonian names as they are indoctrinated into the Babylonian culture. It was an attempt to strip them of anything Jewish and immerse them into Babylon. So let's just look at their names. Daniel means God is my judge, but it's changed to Belteshazzar, <laughs> which means Bel will protect. Bel being one of their gods. All right? Hananiah, God is gracious is changed to Shadrach, command of a coup. He's one of their gods. Mishael, who is like God, is changed to Meshach, who is what a coup is. Again, for one of their gods. And Azariah is, uh, God has helped, and it is changed to Abednego, servant of Nebo, another one of their gods. So you can see that their names, which were very entrenched in the God of Israel, are then changed into names that are again that are uh, encompass the gods of Babylon. Can you imagine? Just think for just a second. Even if your your name doesn't, you know, have a meaning to do with God, just your name, how important that is to you. And you're taken captive by someone who changes your name, and now your name is. You know, uh, Lisa, that's your name. So, so who you are, the identity that you are, that you are wrapped up in is stripped from you, and you are given a whole new identity. 
So we need to think about that as we, be, as we go into our study of the book of Daniel, is that these guys, these young, young boys, 12 to 14 years old, who have been highly trained in, uh, in the uh, royal families, who have had a pretty sweet lives, who have been taught well, are now, they're the best of the best. And now they're going to be taken and they're going to be indoctrinated in the Babylonian culture. It is just one of my pet peeves. I don't know why, but it is one of my pet peeves that so few people know these three boys, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, by their God-given Hebrew names. In our stories, we always call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And in Daniel's story, they're called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Not quite sure why. But you know what? That's not who they were. These guys were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They were believers of the one true God, and their name told who they were. But even that was stripped away from them. And today, if you ask nine out of ten Christian people who've ever been to vacation Bible school, who, who were the three young boys with Daniel, they'll say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Does that not make you kind of sad for them, that that is how they have gone down in history? Now, Daniel doesn't. Daniel is not known as Belteshazzar. Very rarely. We, we always call him Daniel. But the other three boys kind of got shortchanged in that. So, if I can just ask, try and remember their names. Try and remember their names. It's important. It's, I think, I think personally, it's honoring to who they were. All right. According to, according to tradition, writings of the time and inference in Isaiah 39.7, it is fairly certain that all of these young men would have met, been made eunuchs in Babylon. And so that was the common thing that would have been done at that time. We know that the um, man who oversaw these young boys was also the man who oversaw the harem of Nebuchadnezzar. We know that these young men would have never been allowed to have been part of any of that culture without being made eunuchs. Eunuchs always took care of that section of uh, the royal treatment or the royal uh, administration. So, <clears throat> so uh, uh, there's also a, a reference to that when Isaiah says, your young men will be taken and will be made eunuchs in the court of Babylon. <clears throat> and so it's very, very likely, although scripture, uh, Daniel doesn't ever mention it specifically, <laughs> it's very, very likely that that's what would have happened to these young boys. Now, Daniel would remain in Babylon for his entire life. Although his heart was always in his beloved Jerusalem, his calling and his ministry was to be a key player in the service of the palace of Babylon. Daniel will serve under four Babylonian kings. Boy, stop and think about that. Mm -hmm. The changes, that, you know what the changes are when a governor or a president or something leaves administration. People change, policies change, the whole thing changes. Well, Daniel sits under four Babylonian kings. Um, and God will use him to instruct each of them in very important ways. Daniel's writings of the promise of the coming Jewish Messiah were very likely the reason that the Magi, or the astronomers of Babylon, knew that a Jewish king had been born. Daniel was eventually made the head of all the astronomers of Babylon, and his writings would have been held in very high regard. So we're going to read about that, but just real quick, Daniel uh, does a good thing, and he's rewarded by becoming the head astrologer. That's who the wise men were, the magi were, astrologers, mm -hmm. astronomers of Babylon. They watched the skies. They knew what was occurring at that time. They were very wise men. And Daniel is put in charge of them, and his writings would have been something they would have had. Have you ever wondered why Babylonian wise men or astrologers knew that a Jewish king was being born? Why would they care? Why would they look at the stars and know that a Jewish king had been born? Why would they make that humongous journey of 1,700 miles into Jerusalem and say, where is he, this king? 
that is to be born. Now, Daniel never specifically mentions that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Micah does. We're going to read about that later. Some of the others will, but not Daniel. And so when these Babylonian astrologers come, what do they say? Where? Where is he going to be born? Because that information is not part of anything that Daniel would have left for them. But they did know that a Jewish king was coming. So let's read that. It says, there's a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he has found insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. So that's just showing you that he was put in that position. Now, Daniel would have known Jeremiah the prophet, who predicted the coming of the Babylonians. He was also in Babylon, in the palace, at the same time that Ezekiel was ministering to the captives of the, by the river Jabbar. So look at what God has done. He's taken two people out, two young guys. Ezekiel's about 25, Daniel's about 13, 14, whatever. And they're taken into Babylon. And look how he's using them to minister. Ezekiel is talking to the rest of the Babylonian captives down by the river. They are, he is uh, explaining to them what is going to be coming because for the first five, for the first 11 years there in Babylon, Jerusalem is still standing. And so he's explaining to them what is going to be coming and what's going to be happening and preparing them for the fact they think they're going back to Jerusalem any day. And he's preparing them for the fact that is not what God has for them. Mm -hmm. And all of that is occurring down by the river. Daniel is taken, and he's placed in, in the palace. Could there be two more separate ministries? He's placed in the palace, where he has the ear of four kings. A little Jewish captive has the ear of four kings of Babylon. Can you imagine? And yet God opens that door, and he's speaking to them and they're and being used in a very powerful way. <coughs> we know that in the book of Ezekiel, he mentions Daniel twice. So he knows of Daniel. Talks about Daniel's wisdom and what Daniel is able to do. Now Daniel doesn't specifically mention Ezekiel, so we don't know what if what if any communications occurred there. But we do know that it is very likely that they at least knew of each other, whether they got together and talked about anything or not. All right. Um, the writings of Jeremiah will instruct Daniel that the captivity of the Jewish people in Babylon was going to last for 70 years. In chapter 9, Daniel recognizes that the 70 years are nearly completed, and he begins to pray for himself and his people and for the restoration of Jerusalem. All the while, he knows that he will never see Jerusalem with his own eyes. Isn't that sad? So if he is at the end of the 70 years of captivity and he was brought early and he was 12, 13, 14 when he was brought, how old is he at this point when he finds out? In his 80s, right? He's an, he's an old guy. When he is now praying for the people, he recognizes from the right. Sorry, he recognizes from the from the writings of Jeremiah that when God, before God ever sends Nebuchadnezzar in, he says, "Now, when Nebuchadnezzar comes in seventy years, I'm going to let you go again." So the timing had already been set before Nebuchadnezzar ever comes into Jerusalem. And Daniel reads that writing in Jeremiah and recognizes that the 70 years are nearly completed. The book. Now, the book of Daniel is broken up into two major parts. The first half includes six different narratives. There's the refusal of the food served to idols. That's the story you probably know about where he says, just give us vegetables and water. I think that's the basis for that that uh, very popular Daniel diet mm -hmm. that is out there now that people can do and will just be healthy. And indeed, God allowed them to 
uh, eat that and be very healthy and they didn't have to eat any of the other foods. There's the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the great statue of the kingdoms. Let me look at something here. Uh, yeah, we're going to get on back on that in a second. The fiery furnace episode with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. See what I did there? Use their Jewish names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where. And, and it's interesting because Daniel's not part of that one. <coughs> Daniel doesn't put himself in that little uh, incident. It's the, three, the other three Jewish boys who are placed into the fiery furnace. <coughs> Now, the haughty Nebuchadnezzar will go mad for seven years, and he will live as a wild animal. His hair is going to grow, his nails are going to grow, and he grazes on grass out in the field. This, ladies, is the king of Babylon. God had sent him a warning and said, don't get too prideful. And the next chapter, we see Nebuchadnezzar. It says he was pacing around, and he says, look what I've done. See what I've done? And that's the chapter where he's made mad for a period of time, for the uh, seven years that he lives as a wild animal. There's the writing on the wall, remember? Where, where, uh, where the big the hand comes down and writes on the wall, me, 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 turful you sarfin. Even tonight, your kingdom will be taken from you. You've been weighed in the balance and found wanting. All right, and then the last one uh, at, the, at the first section is Daniel is thrown into the den of lions and is not harmed. It, it, in case you didn't know it, Daniel was an old man when that happened. He's about 80 years old or more when he's thrown into the den of lions. Now, the funny part of that is, is when I, uh, when I taught the book of Daniel and I was pulling out a picture, I found out it is nearly impossible to find a picture of an old Daniel in the lion's den. He's always a big strapping young guy, you know, standing in the lion's den with the lions all around him. He's an old man at the time that that happens. He is, uh, uh. now the second half of the book is, uh, is apocalyptic, which means it describes, it, it describes the cataclysmic complete Destruction of the world and mankind. That's what apocalyptic means. It means there's something huge that's going to occur. Uh, there are four different visions that are going to be given to Daniel during that time. There's the four beasts. There's the ram and the goat. There's the 70 weeks of Daniel. The explanation of the final week or the tribulation period. And then there's always, always, remember we've, we've discussed in every one of these, there's that last section, which is the restoration of Israel that will come. Daniel is the Old Testament equivalent to Revelation of the New Testament. Many, if not most, of the events and the prophecies are going to overlap and connect with each other, even though they would have been nearly 700 years apart. And yet... To the detail, they overlap. It is a continual revealing in God's perfect timing. Isn't that cool? Now, now John is going to give a few more details that Daniel doesn't have. And there are some things that are going to be revealed to him. But God didn't want Daniel to reveal them. In fact, at the very end of the book, he says, Daniel, seal up the book until the time of the end. There's only so much that I'm going to give you right now. Perhaps he felt like it couldn't be handled. Perhaps he, well, I don't know. Who knows, you know, the, 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 the thinking, the mind of God. But we do know that later on, John is going to pick up that same thing and then add some more to it. It's God's perfect revelation to his people at the appropriate time. So Daniel is where we get much of our basic eschatology or end time study, which is then going to be confirmed for us in Revelation. This should not surprise us since the end of mankind, the final chapter, was written long before man was ever formed from the dust of the ground. The prophecies of the men that God appoints to speak to the people for all tell parts of the same story because it is not man's story, it is God's story. All right. So, um, 
what do the visions mean? We're just going to be able to go through a little bit of it, and but but the, the two most important ones are, I don't know if you can say that, they're all equally important, but, but there are two that we'll have time to talk about today. Um, a great deal of study has gone into the 14 chapters of Daniel by wonderful biblical scholars throughout the years. There may be some differences in opinion in some of the details, but it comes down to two ways of seeing the books, all right? Two main ways of seeing it. If you do not believe that God will come one day to restore his people to the promised kingdom, if you do not believe in a rapture, if you do not believe in a tribulation period, then you will believe that nearly everything in Daniel and the rest of the prophets and Revelation has already been accomplished. <coughs> All right? Let's stop there for just a minute. That is the church I was raised in. <coughs> that is, a, that is a, the, the church that I believe. It's called preterists. It's preterism. And it simply means that prophetic word was fulfilled in 70 AD. When Jerusalem fell, when the temple fell in 70 AD, now we're talking about the temple that Jesus uh, would have worshipped in. Uh, after the crucifixion of Jesus, after the, um, the leaders of Israel uh, refused to recognize him as the Messiah, after that was all done, all the prophetic word was accomplished in that. Okay, That's the belief system if you are a preterist. Now, if you do believe that God will be faithful to his covenant and that the visions given to all of the prophets, <coughs> including Daniel, are speaking of the same coming time, then Daniel expla explains many of the things that lie ahead for mankind as the world groans in birth pains of that coming time. This understanding helps us to understand much of the prophetic and the apocalyptic writings of the prophet Daniel. That's what I believe now. And that is that this is speaking about that end time scenario where God will once again deal with his people. Where uh, the promises that God made throughout all of the Old Testament of that coming restoration of Israel. How many times have we seen it now, ladies? already were over and over and over again that that coming restoration of Israel will occur. Now, the problem with the first viewpoint, the ones who believe that it's already been accomplished, they believe that the book of Revelation was written before um, seventy AD. Okay? Because if he's talking about what's coming, mm -hmm. and it comes in 70 <coughs> AD, then it had to have been written before 70 AD, right? Well, with all, in the last 20 years, we have such amazing um, archaeologists who are able to date everything specifically that without nearly any exceptions at all, 99% of all biblical scholars date John's writing between 90 and 92 is when John wrote in Patmos. So if he wrote in Patmos in 90 to 92, how could he be writing about Jerusalem that would have occurred 20 years previously? About a coming time when Jerusalem would be destroyed, if you believe that. So that's just something that just goes to show you that that first teaching has taken the prophetic word and skewed it to fit a theology, which is the church has replaced Israel and God no longer needs to deal with Jewish people. It fits that theology, that replacement theology. And if you're going to make that fit, then that's the only way you can make that fit, is that everything that was written was accomplished here. <coughs> That's not at all what occurred. Hmm. All right. Uh, so the statue, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar <laughs> that Daniel will interpret in chapter 2, 
tells what will happen in the world powers of history. Let's look at the little chart I have for you here. This is, this is the statue that I'm talking about. Okay, right here. Now, uh, just very quickly, we're going to read <coughs> that scripture. And, uh, yeah, let's just start here. Go ahead. We'll start here, Drenda. Go ahead. With Daniel 2? Uh, Daniel 2, 31 through 45. It's the page before the statue. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large <laughs> statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. <clears throat> then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might <coughs> and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you rule over them all. You are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. For iron breaks and smashes everything, and as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so his kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. Read that last section. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. So this is the this is the first time that Daniel is going to go to Nebuchadnezzar. He's really given a very difficult task because not only is he told to interpret this dream for Nebuchadnezzar, but Nebuchadnezzar doesn't tell him the dream. He says, "You tell me what I dreamed." You tell me what the vision was, and then I want you to interpret it. So, in order, uh, in order to do that, he gives him, he goes and he prays about it. God gives him the interpretation and the understanding of the dream. And very quickly, what this dream is, is it tells what is going to happen in the world with the most important kingdoms. He says, you are the head of gold, the Babylonian Empire, the main head of gold. Then the Medo-Persians are going to come. They're the silver. And we see that when the handwriting on the wall, that's the night the Medo-Persians come and they destroy Babylon, take over. And now the Medo-Persians are the ones who are in charge. And then the Greek Empire, Alexander the Great, he's going to come and he's going to take over the Persian Empire. And he is the bronze. And then the Roman Empire is going to come and take over the Greek Empire in history, 
And that is what is going to happen. And then the iron and clay is the end time scenario. We don't have time to do the whole interpretation. It's a beautiful story of exactly what's going to be occurring in the end time. But how do we know that iron and clay is going to happen? And it's going to be just like God said. You know how we know it? Because the Babylonians came and fell, and the Medo-Persians came and fell, and the Greeks came and fell, and the Romans came and fell. And so you can be assured that the end time scenario will be exactly what God said it was. Because the dates and the times were exactly what God gave Nebuchadnezzar in this statue. That's what prophecy does, is it builds your faith in what's coming. Now the second one is the 70 weeks of Daniel. Now, weeks of years, or seven times 70 years for a total of 490 years was allotted to the Jewish people. We're gonna talk about this. Great detail was given in the vision for the first of the 69 weeks of years. 483 years of history fulfilled in detail, all leading up to the coming of the Messiah. That is when something unexpected happens, something that no one could foresee. The time clock stopped at the arrival of Messiah, which leaves one week of years or a seven-year period yet to be fulfilled. I know that sounds like a lot, so we're going to talk about it. Let's see. Go to the 77s, Daniel chapter 9. We're going to read that real quick. 77s, Daniel chapter 9. Can we pick up back there, Debbie? Sure. <clears throat> While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the, sins, the sin of my people, Israel, and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, <coughs> while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have come now to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you begin to pray, a word went out which I have come to tell you, for you are a highly are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy-sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolation has been decreed. He will confirm the covenant with many of for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put on <coughs> excuse me, an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is is decreed is poured out on him. Okay. I'm just going to tell you that this particular this particular part of scripture may be the most important end times prophetic scripture that there is in Bible. This particular thing. And it's really it's kind of sad that it is that it has become such a confusing thing because while the details might be confusing when you get into them, the premise is really very simple. Let's go over it real quick. So a a, a seven or a week, whichever you call them, is a terminology. It can be a seven of anything. You know how we might understand it? What is a dozen? If I use the term a dozen. Twelve. twelve. But twelve of what? Anything. anything. Could be twelve of anything is a dozen, right? The same is true for a week. It's seven of anything. It's a terminology that simply means a seven is, a, uh, is seven of can be 
anything. Now what he is telling, what Gabriel is coming down and telling Daniel is, Daniel, here I am. I am going to tell you something very important. There are going to be 70 sevens or 70 periods of time given to your people. And it is going to be from the time that you uh, th that you leave Babylon and go back, there's going to be 77s given to your people. And then he goes into a great deal of detail about what is going to happen to them during that first seven sevens, the third, third uh, um, paragraph, sorry. <laughs> go to the third paragraph. He talks about the first seven sevens, and then there are 62 sevens. And he begins to tell them all the things that are going to happen. So if you have 62 sevens and then you have uh, an, another seven sevens, what do you have? You have 69 sevens or 69 weeks is what we, we generally hear them called. Those 69 weeks are the time that is, uh, God has said there's going to be 70 you're going to get 70, and at the end of that 70, everything is going to happen. It's going to finish transgression. It's going to put an end to sin. It's going to atone for wickedness. It's going to bring everlasting righteousness, sealing up the vision and prophecy. All of that is going to happen at the end of 70 weeks. What is it talking about? It's talking about that time when Jesus comes back and rules and reigns, right? That's when all that other stuff is going to happen. There's no other time when all of that happens. So at the end of the 70 weeks, all that's going to happen. And then he begins to tell them all that's going to happen in these two periods. So there's 69 weeks until Messiah comes. And, and if you continue reading on the scripture, you, you'll understand. 69 weeks, Messiah is going to come. And then it stops. That's the ending of it. There's, there's no more. So what does that leave? It leaves another week. One seven. Well, we know that these are years based on, on what we're being given here. So we know that there is one seven-year period still to be fulfilled. It's called the 70th week of Daniel. One seven-year period that has not yet been accomplished. What is that seven-year period? Tribulation. The tribulation period. And then in that third paragraph, he says, at that time, here's what's gonna, it's going to happen. Uh, the he, the, the uh, war will continue that until the desolations have been decreed. He <coughs> will confirm a covenant. He's talking about the Antichrist. For one seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation. We can go into Revelation and read more about that. What he's telling us is that in the middle of the seven-year uh, period, the Antichrist is going to come into the temple that is going to be standing in Jerusalem, put an end to sacrifice that is going to have begun again, and he is going to put up an idol that they are going to be forced to worship. Then at the second half of the tribulation, which is called the Great Tribulation, Anyone who doesn't worship the beast will be killed. That's all very clear in Revelation. That's why you need that. God didn't give it all to Daniel, but he gave the rest of it to John in Revelation. So that is where we get a great deal of our understanding about what it is. And so the appropriate <coughs> title for that time period is the 70th week of Daniel or the tribulation. Or if you're talking about the second half, you can say the great tribulation when we know exactly what is going to happen. Why does that need to happen? That needs to happen because at the end of that, God is going to usher in the millennial kingdom. That time that he talks about right here, where he says all of that wickedness will be put away and everything will be atoned for. So the 70 weeks of Daniel is critically important to understand if you want to see how the tribulation period is going to play out. Mm. And God gives it to Daniel. Did I miss or am um, just confused? The seven, you have the 62 years and the seven years. What is that, what is that seven years? It's, 
it's broken up into two places. I wish we had time to go through it okay. intricately, but if you look at the third <clears throat> paragraph, it says there will be seven sevens, and then there will be 62 sevens. And at some point, if we study the book of Daniel, we can go into why that is broken up that way. Okay. But there are seven sevens, and then there are 62 sevens, okay. which means that those 69 total are accomplished at Messiah's coming. Or actually at this crucifixion. At the first. Yes. Crucifixion. And so the 69 are accomplished then, only leaving that one week okay. left. Okay. All right. So this is, a, this is a critically important thing for us to know about. All right. Yeah, I think it's interchangeable. Weeks and years. Yeah. You're interchangeable. Yes. Those. Yes. Yes. The seven years. Yeah. That one seven-year period is called a seven Okay. 69. Are those years? 69 sevens. 69 sevens. So if you took 69 mm. and you took and you times it by seven, you get the 483. So if there are 490 years that are given to your people, which is what he says, okay. and 483 have been accomplished, how many are left? Seven. And we can't get bogged down in the, the word year. Because right, because it's a year, seven. It's a seven. Yeah, our year is not God's year. Right, right, exactly. So I, did I erase it? Did Clear you not want me to erase it? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all right. That's all right. It's just 63. 62 plus 7 is 69. I think it's like Yeah, 62 plus 7 is 69. And if there are 70, that means there's one seven left. Yeah. Or one week of years. Or one seven year time period. And what's really funny is if you overlap Revelation and you overlap Daniel, it's listed in years, it's listed in months, and it's broken down into days. It's seven years, no matter how you look at it. But Revelation breaks it down into days and, and months and years. And it's always the same. And it's always broken down into two parts. And at the middle, something important happens. That's when the Antichrist goes into the temple and sets up his own statue to be worshipped at that time. What's, what begins the seven, the final seven-week period? A lot of times people want to know that. What begins it? It's the signing of the treaty. That begins it. It's not the rapture of the church. It's not any of the things that we traditionally think it is. What begins the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel is the signing of the treaty. And that's mentioned right here when he says, uh, where do I have it? He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. Okay, there's more details given about that later in other places, but it's confirming the covenant is the signing of a treaty. Somehow the Jewish people are going to make sign a treaty that is going to be a seven-year peace treaty that's okay. going to happen. And when they do that, and they buy into it, and they sign it, the 70th week of Daniel begins. Okay, so the way we always thought of that as a tribulation us pre-tribbers think that's when we go but then we're saying we're still here we're no what I'm saying is that begins the beginning of the tribulation now if you're a pre-tribber you believe that's the time when you're when you're going to be taken if you're a pre-trib rapture you believe that's when you're going to be taken. If you are a, um, a mid-tripper and you believe that it comes before the great tribulation, then, it, then it's halfway. So, that, is, so it, that doesn't have anything to do with what you believe about the rapture. Okay, yeah. The rapture could occur at any time, but that begins the tribulation. Then you can have the arguments about, well, where in the tribulation are we? do we go? Okay. But the signing of the covenant, the, the, the rapture of the church isn't the beginning of the, of the tribulation. Now, you, the rapture of the church could occur, and then that could facilitate the signing of the covenant. We don't know in what order they will come. Okay. But we do know that it is not the rapture of the church that starts it. Okay. It's the signing of the covenant. 
confirming the covenant that starts the 70th week of Daniel. All right, angels. Daniel introduces two angels in his book. There is Michael, who is the prince of Israel, and he is given charge over the people of Israel. He is called the chief angel. Also in the book of Jude, he is called the archangel. He is the only angel in scripture that is ever called an archangel. None of the others are called archangels. All right, and if you look at 12.1, Daniel 12.1, at that time, Michael, the great <clears throat> prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of the nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. And he's talking about that end time, that 70th week of Daniel. Now, the other angel that's mentioned is Gabriel, and he is the messenger angel. Gabriel is the one who always brings messages. He brings them to Mary. He brings them to John the Baptist's father. He is the messenger angel. Chapter 10 gives us many details about the spiritual battle that is constantly being fought in the heavenly realm. It is our clearest window into unseen things that are occurring as spiritual warfare rages on for the souls of men. If we had eyes to see it, it is, it, it is a constant thing that is going on. We're just going to just quickly look at this. It says, don't be afraid. I'm coming to you, Daniel. I want to tell you about it. He says, um, uh, go down to the very bottom. So he said, do you know why I've come to you? This is Gabriel. Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first, I want to tell you about what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. And so he's saying, I, I, I wanted to come sooner to get to you, but I've been fighting with the prince of Persia, and the prince of Greece has come down to fight with me, and I couldn't get away until Michael, the prince of Israel, came and helped me out. And so now I'm here, and I'm going to tell you about this. And it's our clearest window of that constant battle of angelic warfare that is occurring for people. Oftentimes I talk about the spiritual battle, the warfare that's occurring, for example, in Persia. Throughout all of the Bible, the book of Esther, uh, 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 throughout all of the Bible, Persia has been an enemy of Israel, wanted to annihilate them as a people. Not just take over or hurt them, but annihilate them as a people. That spiritual warfare is going on today because Persia is what? Iran. Who is the most active people? Who has their terrorist group, Hezbollah, out there trying to take Israel out at every opportunity? Iran. That spiritual warfare is ongoing in these places. It does not stop. And this is a perfect example of that. All right, let's finish up. Daniel is packed with information that helps us to understand that God has a perfect plan for his people. And we are included in that plan. Nothing is left to chance. Everything was preordained by God from the foundation of the earth's creation. Prophecy is not just to give us knowledge. Prophecy is to give us hope and to help us be ready and prepared to be used by God wherever and whenever he calls us. Amen. Even though Daniel was taken captive as a young boy and stripped of everything that he loved and held dear to him, he was able to be used by God in such a powerful way and fulfilled the very purpose for which he was born. We too should remember that this world is not our home. We are not to get too comfortable or complacent with the details of our life. Sometimes we feel as if the most precious things in our lives are being stripped away from us, and it can cause us to question, why would this be? But like Daniel, the very experience of depending fully and totally on the Lord can cause us to focus on the purpose we were created for. Prophecy shows us that we do not need to live in fear or dread of what is to come. Instead, we learn to rest in the knowledge that God has this, and every trial and circumstance will be used to accomplish the goal of fulfilling our purpose. Nothing that happens is ever wasted. It is used as the threads of the tapestry 
that God is weaving. All right. Uh, praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises them up. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in the darkness and light dwells with him. A couple pictures. This is a, 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 an example of what Babylon would have looked like at the time. It was an amazing, beautiful, up-to-date, modern metro city. Um, the other picture, I hear Damien too. The last one is the story of Daniel in the lion's den. I, I, that's a typical picture that you'll see down there of the older Daniel. I like that one. But this is my very favorite, and so I had to print it out for you guys. Oh, so I pretty. love this particular one of Daniel in the lion's den. So just a little something to leave you with a memory of that. Would that be Michael? Or that would, that would uh, uh, well, we're not told which <laughs> angels were in there with him at the time, so we just don't know. Isn't that cool, though, to, to think oh, this? Oh, rewrite this in your heart. <laughs> it's so much easier to understand. What's, rewrite what? All the stuff you read with all the roots and the, like, <laughs> everything. Uh, everything. Uh, <laughs> Well, it's, uh, it, it, is a, it's, it can be a complex thing, but you know what? Ultimately, it, it, le the learning, thank you, the learning of it is layers, right? You can't be 